Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of Mark's Side of the Ring. I am your host, Miguel Manetti, alongside one of my co-hosts, Fred Decor. What's going on, buddy? What's happening, Miguel? How you doing? I'm doing well, my friend. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. So, yeah, unfortunately, uh, our other co-host here, our best bud, Nick Fiorentino, is not able to join us today, but... Uh, I got Fred DeCourt here, so we're excited. We're here to give you another exciting ed- edition of the show, of course. But before we kick it off, Fred, for those watching at home, listening at home, what do you got drinking this week, my friend? So in my trusty little glass here, I got a little bit of the old trusted Tito's mixed with a little lemon lime club soda. Wow. Keeping it. From the peanut butter whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a change, kind of quite a change from the screwball. But yeah, uh, as always, no one gives a rat's ass what you're drinking. I hope you do no. enjoy though. Bottoms up, bottoms up. But we are here today uh, as we kick off the final probably episode of 2020. Uh, this is going to be an exciting show today. We're actually going to do kind of a rip off from WWE Slammy Awards. We're going to go with our year end. WWE Awards. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read off the following categories that we decided uh, that we are going to um, uh, give our thoughts on who should win these perspective categories. So we are going to do six different categories. Um, We are going to do the male WWE Superstar of the Year. We're going to do the female WWE Superstar of the Year. We're going to do the Rookie of the Year slash Breakout Star. Um, and the reason I write rookie of the year slash breakout star is you can either pick someone that is a true rookie in data B or someone that had a breakout year first time in 2020. Uh, the next category is going to be best pay-per-view of the year for data B. Next category is match of the year for data B. And last but not least, the moment of the year for WWE. And certainly 2020 has been an unprecedented year. So, uh, Safe to say there's probably been a few different moments here, but uh, I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Fred, are you ready to kick this off, my friend? I'm very excited. Like you said, 2020 has been some year. Thankfully, it's at a close, and uh, I'm glad to be able to take the best of what was one of the worst years ever. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to start with our first category here, and we're going to work our way backwards, Fred. We're going to start off with the moment of the year. So uh, I'll let you give your thoughts on who you would give for each category first. Uh, give some thoughts around it, and then, of course, I'll do the same. So, without further any further ado, my friend, what is, in your opinion, the moment of the year for 2020 in WWE? For me, uh, my moment of the year would have to be the return of Edge at the Royal Rumble. I think a lot of people would say that. That moment especially being that it was one of only very few moments with such a live crowd that we wouldn't know that at at that time in January, but just, it it seems like a lifetime ago, um, but it was only 10 months, 11 months ago. Uh, That has to be the moment. I mean, even if we had a year full of shows with a live crowd and we had a WrestleMania with a live, I still think that moment would have quite possibly been, the top because edge being gone so long and it n- not really being out there. There was a rumor, but then he had kiboshed that and people I think didn't really think it would happen. And then it did. And it was just amazing. Um, so I'm going to go with edge returning at the Royal rumble as the moment of the year. Yeah, man. You know, and, uh, and, and I'll kind of just give my thoughts right away. I picked the exact same thing, right? Yeah. Pretty much all the same reasons. I mean, I think it's kind of hard to dispute that being the top moment of the year, uh, being the fact that at the time there was a crowd and we didn't know there wasn't going to be a crowd. But if you remember, uh, Fred, you were at my house that night, right? We had yeah. a little bit of, we had a gathering back when you were allowed to have gatherings. And more than 10 people. More than 10 people, yes. No masks. It was exactly. crazy. No what masks. a wild right? time. We had, we had about 15 people probably for the, my Rumble party that I try to do every year. And uh, when Edge's music hit, I mean, I think we were just all going bananas, right? There were, as Pat Patterson would say, yes, going banana. Yeah. <laughs> there was literally like 15 grown-ass men jumping up and down like five-year-old little girls hugging each other and slapping high fives. It was incredible. I, I remember uh, my wife and uh, a few of the other uh, guys, wives slash girlfriends were there at our house. Right. And we were just looking at us like something was wrong with us. They're yeah. like, you don't get it. What is happening? Like, what are you going so crazy for? Who is this guy? And right. I'm like, 
Hedge is back. I can't and, believe it. I'm like yeah. going insane about it. Right. I mean, it was, I mean, I still get goosebumps when I see it because, and I try to put myself back in that time, you know, like when edge wasn't wrestling, you know what I mean? Now he's had a couple of matches. Unfortunately, he had the tricep injury to kind of derail the rest of the year for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, you put yourself back in that mindset when he hadn't been seen in a wrestling ring in nine years and not only like, it wasn't like he just took retired. I mean, he had to because of a broken neck or spinal stenosis was told he would never wrestle again. So you put all that in and you know, you figure after nine years, okay, it's, it's done. You know, I mean, it is what it is, you know, come to terms with it. And I had come to terms with it. You know, I mean, I always wished edge would come back, but I never really put much thought into it because I thought it's not, possible you know i think people still like talk about Shawn michaels coming back because it is possible right you know things like that but edge it just wasn't possible so you you know it'd be cool but you never really thought and then for something like that to happen nine years later just it's incredible i remember being at wrestlemania 27 which was my first mm -hmm. wrestlemania and little did right. know that it was edge's last wrestlemania and his last match ever yeah yeah he didn't know he didn't know. Nobody knew, right? But I remember, yeah. I remember being there and thinking, "Oh wow, what a great match!" And then two weeks later, he's on Raw retiring, right? Yeah. And for years, I was so excited to be able to say, at least at the very least, I was at Edge's final ever wrestling match, right? Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, he won the World Heavyweight Championship. I mean, like it was just a, a beautiful night. And I remember it was the first match of the night, right? Of her yeah. Which was, I remember it was cause that was like one of the first times they had done that, right? Yeah, uh, you know, then they would start doing it more, a little more. But that was, and that was huge. If the world title was opening up WrestleMania, you know, when you had the, when well, you had the two titles now, also. But, um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think there's, there's definitely no other choice uh, to say moment of the year than Edge winning or sorry, mm -hmm. returning at the Royal Rumble. I was thinking about this because I, I kind of thought, and before we move on to our next topic, just really quickly, I kind of thought you were going to pick the same thing as me because it's all kind of obvious. But if, if you had to say besides that. What would you say is probably the second biggest moment of the year? I'll give you my thoughts, but I'm curious to think, you know, I'm putting you on the spot here, but. I mean, be, because of him being my favorite wrestler, I mean, the Undertaker farewell would have to be up there. I mean, it, it's unfortunate that there were no fans for it. I think it would have been much more of a moment had there been fans, but majority of the shows this year didn't. So I think from the, uh, history factor of that moment from years from now that that was takers final farewell um, is definitely up there as far as other moments you know it's been hard because the fans make so much of a moment right, right? you know for instance edge his retirement speech in 2011 wouldn't have been as much of a moment if there was no crowd there when he did that Right. You know, he was feeding off their emotion. The fans were feeding off of his emotion. I mean, it was just, that's the magic of pro wrestling. So it's kind of hard to pick out another moment um, from the year because there hasn't, I feel like there hasn't been moments because there, ha there hasn't been the ability to have them without a crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I'll go with Taker, Taker's final farewell because, you know, he is my favorite, and even though it wasn't what it could have been with a live crowd, it was still, you know, historical and, and, a, and a big moment for the year for WWE. I like that a lot. I think it's definitely a, a top moment. But what about this? What about Clash Champions, Roman Reigns and Jey Uso, right? When he's just – and it's the first time he's annihilating his crowd. Yeah. Right. That's another show yeah. that you and I watched together. Right. And we had about, you know, obviously a socially distant party, right? We had about like five. Yeah, and there, was only, there, was, there was only like five. There was only five. But uh, we had a social distance kind of gathering to watch Clash of Champions. And I remember right. me and you, my brother, our friend Ronnie, I think it was just the four of us. And we're all watching, right? And obviously we know that wrestling is scripted, right? And, and it's a story. But you genuinely mm -hmm. felt that emotion that first time that Roman abused his cousin, right? Yeah. And I mean, we were invested in that match. Right. And, and to me, right now, 
it's still really cool when it happens, right? But right. that first time that it happened, right? Because yeah. up, leading up to it, he had kind of bullied uh, his cousin Jay a little bit. But that was the first time where he annihilated him in a match and was making an example out of him, right? right. And his brother, uh, Jimmy Uso, comes running down with the towel saying, you know, pretty much throwing in the towel, throwing in the towel. And you just see Roman Reigns say, acknowledge me as the tribal chief, right? Acknowledge right. me. To me, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's number two, but it's what comes to mind as one of the biggest. No, th that is, that was, I mean, yeah, that was a great moment for sure. Um, and really solidified that heel turn of Roman, you know, because in prior to that, it, it was teased, but got a little more aggressive every week, but that really is what pushed it. Over. Yeah. Absolutely. You, know, you speak about other moments. I hadn't really thought about this one, but uh, for moments of the year, and I could only imagine had a crowd been there at SummerSlam when he returned. Right. And you didn't see it, the, the angle that it came from where he came through and he speared, I think, I forget if he speared uh, Bray or he speared Braun. I think it was Braun. Oh, it was, oh, it was Braun? Okay. Yeah. Couldn't remember. But that was a hell of a moment because nobody saw that coming. And it, like, again, had there been a crowd, that would have been amazing. But we saw him very aggressive that night at SummerSlam. But, you know, you just thought, damn, all right, Roman's coming back fierce. But, yeah. You know, so another big moment. Another yeah. Big moment. Um, I'm curious about the next topic here. Uh, I'm curious to see if we pick the same answer again. But what is your match of the year? The one match that stands out above all and all of the to be for 2020. For me, this is an easy one. Uh, if you consider it a, a match, I think if you ask people what was the most talked about match of the year. I think it would be the Boneyard match between Undertaker and AJ Styles. Um, I just think that was the most iconic match of the year. Most times, match of the year will come from a WrestleMania, half of that being because it was at WrestleMania. So that is part of why the, that match, is, the match of the year is usually from that show because, you know. Um, I think, the, I mean, I will say, I think the Rumble match this year was very well booked, one of the best booked Rumbles in years. Um. But I never like to give the Royal Rumble the match of the year because I feel like even though it's a, it is a match, it's not – I don't know. I, look, I view it differently. So I'm going to go with um, the Boneyard match, Taker and AJ. I thought they put on a match. You talking about making chicken salad out of chicken shit, and they, they did that tenfold. So, yeah, that's going to be my pick. Well, that's a great choice, but this will be the first one we disagree on because – for me, match of the year, and I know you're going to say this was definitely a top match, but I'm going with Roman versus Drew at Survivor Series. I uh, mean, that was, yes. Wow, that was right? Excellent. I mean, excellent match. The chemistry that these two had, right? First yeah. time locking up uh, under their new gimmicks, right? Their current right, right. personas, well, uh, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, these two completely turned it on, right? And I remember last month, and you know, obviously this match only happened a month ago. I remember right. leading up to this match, or maybe right after, I said to you, I said, Fred, we watched this match at WrestleMania 35 in Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a long show, right? And I think they went on either second to last or third to last. I remember they were towards the tail end of the night when it was getting late. Yeah. And I just couldn't care less about these two wrestling each other. I think it was the one match, you know, I was happy for Roman. I remember it was his comeback, but I just couldn't right. care less about them two locking arms. Right. But mm -hmm. wow. A year and a half later, these two made me, and again, it was another show that you and I watched together. Yeah. Yeah. Watched the year <laughs> together. But yep. I think I looked at you and I was like, I want to see more of that match. Oh yeah. yeah. And, I, and I still do. I really hope we get it at a WrestleMania. Yeah, I mean, man, the chemistry that these two put on together was bar none, to me, the best of 2020. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree, the Boneyard was definitely fantastic. But to me, and, and I think we're, you know, it's semantics here, but I'm going with the traditional wrestling match in a ring, Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre, because to me, they put on a magical match, a magical moment there with no live audience, which is not easy to do, as we know. No. I mean, yeah, if I was going to pick, like, a regular match that happened in, in an arena, um, that would have to be my match of the year also. 
Like if I was picking a traditional match, yeah, they definitely I think had the best match of the. I mean, there is one of the ones I was actually tossing with between the Boneyard uh, was the greatest wrestling match ever between because I really I mean I don't know if it was the greatest ever, but it really was one of the greatest ever between Edge and uh, and Orton at Backlash. I was concerned about. It. I was like, there's no way. And they even said, you know, how do yeah you've already put us in a corner because you've called it that right. But I think with all that being said, they still put on one of the greatest ever. So that, but yeah, but so between Edge and uh, Orton and, and then the Roman and Drew, as far as the traditional matches, those would be like my two candidates. Um, I, hard for me to pick one of those two, but. Yeah, and I really like the greatest wrestling match ever, right, between Orton and Edge. Uh, yeah. They obviously, uh, you know, excelled above expectations on that because right. I remember going into that match saying there's just no way it's going to be the greatest yeah. match. And, and it's not the greatest match ever. It just, it's just not, but no. it never. That, 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 Sean and Sean and Undertaker took that in 2009 for the yeah, record. And no matter what they did, it would never be without a live audience there, but right. they, they certainly exceed expectations on that. Right. Yeah. They went above and beyond on that match, but I don't know, just something about McIntyre and Roman. I don't know what it was. It could be the well, Thunderdome. It could be just the storylines leading into it. Champion versus champion. I mean, all of that plays a factor in my opinion. Right. I mean, yeah, the Thunderdome could, if you remember the greatest from was the first time that they actually used crowd noise. Yes, that's right. And, th- and then they, then they didn't do it, you know, and then they brought it in for the, the Thunderdome. But, um, I think what you know what what it is is Drew. Even though, yeah, I mean they had the crowd noise, but being in an arena setting, the Thunderdome still made it bigger. But with Drew and Roman, you had not that Orton and Edge aren't two top guys; they are, but Roman and Drew are like the two big mega stars. It's the showdown match, and that's what you saw. You saw the two mega stars going at it. Well, Edge and Orton are both huge stars and have been for years going at it. Yes, but this was like Stone Cold and The Rock. I mean, you know, I'm not comparing anybody to Stone Cold and The Rock. That's a special time that I've never. <laughs> but that idea of two top guys in the business at the same time, you know, I think it's a shame that these two are really coming into their, their own now with no crowd. Because I think if they if there was a crowd, we'd be almost as you know close to like the um, the effect that Austin and Rock had. Maybe not as huge because the time is different, but as far as being two huge stars, I think that they are that you know like John Cena and Batista, right? Right. I think these two. I mean, Roman's been a top guy for a while, but he's really turned it up this year, you know? Yeah. I, I think the, the number one reason is it was a showdown match between two credible opponents. Right. right? And right. wrestling, I think we both will agree wrestling is definitely at its best when it's believable. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have two monsters like Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre, both world champions, both at the top of their game, both massive human beings colliding. Right. With one another. So, yeah, I, I thought they, they, that is a great match. I mean, you, you know, I'm glad you brought that one up for sure. That, that to me, matches are always the best when they leave the audience wanting more, and I certainly want to see more of that match. Oh, big time for sure. Uh, I'm also curious about your next answer here. So the next category is the best pay per view of the year. So hit us, man. What what do you got? You know, again, this is this is an unfair question because you, there's been great pay per views inside the Thunderdome. I won't say any of the pay reviews in the Performance Center were great, um, but I'm gonna have to go with the Royal Rumble. I mean, just like I referenced before, that match was so good. It was, I think, it was between you had the first half being the Brock takeover to the second half being then Drew dominating. You had you told two stories in that Rumble, you know. You had Brock dominate, and then you made a star out of Drew McIntyre. You know, plus like Daniel Bryan and The Fiend had a match. Uh, Roman and uh, Baron Corbin had, I believe it was a last man standing at the Rumble, and they fought in the stadium. So 
I mean, really, I think the Royal Rumble this year was like the WrestleMania. So, so this is an interesting debate because, uh, and I'll give you my answer in a second, but does one match, and especially when it's an attraction match like the Royal Rumble, does that solidify the best pay-per-view in your opinion? Because to me, the best pay-per-view is usually one that stands out with multiple at right. least four-star matches. And, and I think it's fair to say that the Royal Rumble pay-per-view was, was really good, right? And the Royal Rumble match itself told some amazing stories with, like you said, with Brock and with Edge and with Roman at the end. But I don't know. I felt like the rest of the pay-per-view was a little bit, for, you know, a little bit forgettable. right? Because yeah, I mean, I'm not even going – yeah, I mean, besides the Rumble being really good and the um, – the match Daniel Bryan and the Fiend had a had a really good match, but yeah, you, you, you kind of always just remember the Rumble match most of the time from the Royal Rumble pay per view, and I normally would have never picked the Rumble as the best pay per view of the year, uh, but I just I just feel like, and it's not no fault of WWE, I just feel as great as they put on shows to the best of their ability without fans, I can't rightfully pick anything, whether it was the PC or the Thunderdome that compares to having the live crowd, especially of that size for the rumble. You know, they did, uh, they did the chamber, which we were there for, which was the last pay-per-view in front of a crowd. Um, I think that was the only other pay-per-view with, with the crowd because they had the takeover in February. Show, uh, super showdown, right? Or crown jewel. Oh, right. Super showdown, which was terrible. And yeah, yeah, that was not good. Um, all right. Well, that's that's it. That's why I'm picking the Rumble. I just think, as from from a just from it being an iconic show, I I don't feel like we've had an iconic show in the Thunderdome. I mean, they've worked with what they've had, but I just you know, I don't know. They've put on great shows. I just I, I can't say that they. I can't say a show without fans has been the best show of the year. Okay. Well, I'm going to debate you on that because I'm actually going with the show that did not have fans as best pay-per-view of the year. And I'm going, okay. with, I'm going with Hell in the Cell. I thought Hell, Hell in the, the Cell, Cell, top to bottom this year, was the best pay-per-view of 2020. And uh, the reasons for that is I thought for the probably the first time in a long time, all three Cell matches delivered, right? It's already, I will give you that. It's already yeah. overkill to have multiple Hell in the Cell matches, right? Three of them. But right. somehow, some way... Roman and Jey Uso, Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton, and Sasha and Bailey put on three spectacular yeah. yet very different Hell in the Cell matches. Now, to me, right, and this is where the, my argument comes in, is if you can get through at least two, preferably three matches in the entire night to be matches that are truly rememberable, right, I mm -hmm. think that's what constitutes the best pay-per-view of the year. Now, I can't tell you and remember off the top of my head the other matches at Hell in a Cell because I don't think they were that memorable, right? Right, well, yeah. All three of those Hell in a Cell matches delivered. I mean, you had three rivalries that culminated inside Hell in a Cell. Sasha and Bailey totally deserved it, right? Oh, big Drew, time. Drew and Orton, which was the least uh, going in, right? The, the one that you wanted to see the least ended up yeah. delivering pretty hard and it closed the show. And then of yeah. course, Roman and Jey Uso. I mean, that's when that feud was starting to hit some really big fire here. Uh, all three of them delivered. They were all spectacular matches, right? In mm -hmm. the Thunderdome era. Yeah, they were. Yeah, in the Thunderdome era is not exactly easy to put on five-star matches given the fact that there's no crowd live crowd reaction. But I'm right. going with telling the Cell. 2020 is the best pay-per-view of the year. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting debate to see if one match being a five star plus match or whatever can make an entire show, the best pay-per-view of the year. But yeah, All I right. thought Royal Rumble was really good, but I'm going to go with Hell in a Cell on this one. So, you know, Hell in a Cell was good. Listen again, they've put on great. I thought TLC was a really good show Sunday, yeah. which I know will move talk about a little bit later but um SummerSlam I thought was was a really good show I think all their shows in the perform uh I'm sorry in the Thunderdome era have been none of them have been like ugh like they've all been no they've no, all ever been really good to really really good I would say yeah. range right right yeah no I, I can't disagree on that I think they really have the PC shows were hard you they know were. they were very hard um but no ever since they've been to the Thunderdome I think every pay per view I mean, SummerSlam, Clash of Champions, Hell in a Cell, Survivor Series, TLC. I thought they were, I, 
they were all good shows. None of them were bad shows. And uh, Payback. I don't really, I don't remember much from Payback, but I don't remember it being a bad show. No. That was so, good too. Yeah, I mean, I know they had, the big thing was the triple threat. That was like the main match, the triple threat between Roman, uh, Braun, and, and... Keith and, Lee uh, beat Randy Orton, right? I remember that. Yes, right. That, that was Keith Lee's... He had only just debuted that Monday. Yeah, and that was... They were in a tough position. Well, they put themselves in it, but they were in a tough position to do a pay-per-view a week after SummerSlam. Yeah, that was... Shock. I was still surprised they did that. I, I, I had heard that that was like a, um, a test, like to see how that did. I, I don't know how it did, but... Um, I mean, there's been great shows in the Thunderdome, for sure. I, I can't say there hasn't. It's definitely helped, for sure. So, so far, we only agree on one of the categories. So, we're, yeah. we're coming to our fourth out of six categories here. Uh, so, the next one I want to clarify before you give your answer. So, I put Rookie of the Year slash Breakout Star, and I kind of mentioned it before, but just to reiterate, you can either pick somebody who's a true rookie of day to be or someone that's had a breakout year. So. Go ahead and give us your one person. Yeah, so th this one's kind of hard. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, because the – I mean, I don't think there's really been any rookie that has really broke out. I, I thought I could have maybe had said Keith Lee, maybe if you asked me a few months ago, who would be the breakout star. But I honestly don't think he's gotten – to that point, unfortunately, not to say he won't, but I just don't think he, you know. Um, so let me let me pose the question a different way for you. Who in 2020 had a breakout year versus maybe if they weren't a rookie, what they were doing in years past? Yeah. Oh, well, then for me, it'd be Drew McIntyre. I, I don't really consider him a breakout star because he's kind of been making a name for himself over the last – few years right you know between being in nxt and then even though he didn't get to his full potential when he was the bad heel you know the last couple of years on raw you know he, he was big enough to face roman at wrestlemania a couple of years ago like we just talked about before but i mean this was definitely drew's breakout year i mean starting with that rump with the rumble he just became a megastar and i think he he would have even maybe been bigger if there was a crowd this whole time but again you can't, you know, do anything about that. So, yeah, then he's not a rookie. I, I don't know if he's a breakout star because he's been there, but it's definitely been Drew McIntyre's breakout year. Okay. So. I, I, I like your answer. I'm not going to dispute it because I think that constitutes for a breakout year for him. Uh, mm -hmm. I would argue that he had a really good 2019 also leading up to 2020, but uh, I, I do like your answer on that. Um, my breakout star, and again, he's not a rookie either, but someone that completely did a 180 from 2019 to 2020 has got to be Jey Uso, right? That's a fair, very fair point. And, yeah, I mean, um, he's definitely had the best year of his career. I mean, by far. I mean, this storyline with the Roman, right? I mean, yeah. if, we, if we go to end of August, early September, and you were to come on this podcast and say, hey, Miguel, Jey Uso, by the end of the year, he's going to be one of the most talked about wrestlers of 2020. I would say, Fred, I don't know what you spiked in that. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, be cut off. I'd be cut off. <laughs> You'd be cut off if we were at the bar. They wouldn't be serving anymore. I'd be telling you, you're out of your freaking mind. But here we I are, uh, end of December. Jey Uso has out, had, in my opinion, probably a breakout year. I mean, yeah. he was an afterthought in 2019, an afterthought in 2018, right? I mean, he's had a really great time yeah. run with his brother. Obviously, his brother gets put on the shelf with an injury, but – man, have they used this guy to his probably fullest potential? Which I think, you know, that his brother being out certainly helped him. Yeah. Because Jimmy, even though they were a tag team and they were both kind of on, you know, the same level as far as like their level of superstar, but more people knew Jimmy because of Total Divas. I think he had a little more name recognition or face recognition name value a little bit because of people knowing him from that, from that show. Right. Um, 
And I think he was always a little more charismatic out of the two. So his brother being away really helped make him, you know, make, help make Jay. Um, it was definitely the best thing to happen for him, right? I mean, oh, huge. <laughs> yeah. And, and the fact that now, like what it's turned into, right? Now, it's, which we had an idea that it would maybe turn into this. But like him being Roman's, I, I'm not going to use the word lackey, but being his, you know. He's like, he's, I mean, I, I hate to use this comparison because it's, you know, it's horrifying, but he's like an abused wife, right? That yeah. That keeps coming around for more, right? Right. It's like yeah. The wife you hear about that her husband beats her, right? Whether it's emotionally or physically, and mm -hmm. she just takes it, right? And yep. keeps coming back. And that's what the storylines become with Roman and Uso is that Uso admires his cousin Roman Reigns so much that he's willing to take these physical, emotional, mental abuses week after week. Yeah. And his loyalty is, is, is so far coming out that he's willing to do his dirty work for him at times. I mean, right. it, it's a remarkable storyline. Uh, I know we've, we've talked about it kind of almost at nauseum here on this podcast, <laughs> but you know, I got to just give kudos to whoever the hell came up with this whole thing. I, I, I like to think it's a Paul Heyman thing. I'm sure it is. I'm sure he's mm -hmm. had his hands involved in this, but I mean, man, Jay Uso, you know, obviously you give, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent to Roman Reigns, but you got to give some percentage of the storyline Jay Uso because he's played. Yeah, I mean, and especially being that he he was not used to being in that territory. You know, there's a there's a difference when you're in a main event. It's a different, it's a whole different ball game. And he came in there with no experience of at that level and really held his own. But again, he, it's in his blood. You know, I mean, the, there you go. <laughs> the bloodline, brother. I mean, he's an Anoa'i. The bloodline runs deep. The bloodline you know, so, runs deep. So, yeah. yeah, Jay Uso has had no, that's, the, I, I can't disagree with you on that pick either. I think Jay Uso, he solidified himself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I honestly could see him. I, I'm surprised they haven't done this yet unless because – they want to focus on Roman and they don't want, they're not really building a stable kind of thing yet. Maybe they will when Jimmy comes back, but like him going for the intercontinental title, mm -hmm. he's the IC champ. Roman's the champ, right? I don't know. I definitely think we'll see th them be the tag champs. Once Jimmy comes back. Roman yeah, I think so too. And yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I would believe Jay now going for the IC title. Yeah. Which I, you know, I mean, yeah, he went for the WWE title, but, you know, still, I, I, I think he could go for the IC title and be believable in him going for it and winning it. Dude, and, and one of the things they've been able to do is they've been able to, to create a solid upper mid card by having Jey Uso. I mean, the guy, yeah. if you remember, he pinned Daniel Bryan. He pinned right. AJ Styles, right? Yep. And I Kevin mean, Owens. And Kevin Owens, yeah. He's pinned three... Former world champion, three credible former world champions. So right. uh, it's it's been an awesome year for Ju. So, but um, let's move on now to our final two categories, and that's the female and male superstar of the year. So, uh, female, I'll let you go first. I'm curious on who your thoughts are. So, give me that. Yeah, this this is hard for me because there it's down to to two for me. Um, but. I'm going to go with Sasha Banks. My other choice was her counterpart, obviously, Bailey, because I think she had an incredible year. But I think Sasha has been, you know, the bigger part of their duo the whole year. And now with her being the champion and holding it for more than a month, you know, um, I think she just had an incredible year. From all the stuff they did, I mean, her and Bailey together, you know, were amazing throughout the whole PC era. I mean, their their time on commentary, and then they were going from to all three brands as right. the team champions. While Bailey was the SmackDown Women's Champion, then Sasha was the Raw Women's Champion. I mean, they had a hell of a run. But I, I'm going to choose Sasha as the overall uh, female superstar of the year. So I got the same pick as you. I went with Sasha as well, too, uh, for all the same reasons. And, and 
don't, you know, don't forget. And now you kind of touch on this. I mean, her and Bailey kind of carried the piece here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Things were really bad in March, April, May, right? June with storyline booking. Yeah. The one constant that I thought was always on par, on point, I should say, was Sasha and Bailey being on all three shows. Um, yeah. Were they a little overexposed at times? Maybe, right? But right. I thoroughly enjoyed what they did knowing the eventual breakup, right? The that was the thing. I never got sick of them. Right. Like, it never felt like, oh, they're, here they are again. Like, that was the idea, right? Was that they were all over and they, you know, they were annoying. You know, that was, you know, I think that's what made it work. Yeah. And, and, you know, at a time where there was like nothing going on in the storylines, right. It was dragging, it was dragging all their shows. Unfortunately were dragging, you know, at that point of the year. Um, I know I always thought Sasha and Bailey were, were the constant. And right. I, I agree with what you said about Bailey being the other choice. And I would have given it to Bailey, but I think these last two months now, Right. And, and it's not Bailey's fault. It's just the way creative has been for her. Sasha's mm-hmm. on top, right? Sasha's now the women's champion. So right. We've seen more of Sasha in 2020 than we did in Bailey. Yeah. Right? I mean, had Bailey been the champion still right now, maybe my choice would have been Bailey. Yes. Yeah. And, and same. And, you know, I think what solidified it for me was last Sunday, Sasha made Carmella had the best match of her career. Oh, yeah. I love their storyline because they never really feuded. I saw it's a new feud, and I think they really work well with each other. Well, uh, and a lot of people were, were nervous because, you know, Carmella's had some backlash in the past, right, about her in-ring ability. But mm-hmm. Sasha, to me, is the AJ Styles of the women's division. I mean, she could have a, a good match with a broomstick, right? But Sasha no. took a pretty hard task by having Carmella have the, the best match of her career, in my opinion. Yeah. That was Carmella's number one match. But, yeah, Sasha's been a, a constant for 2020. Um, she's going strong as a SmackDown Wins champion, and I expect some big things from her. Uh, I want to get your your uh, prediction here before we move on to the men, the male superstar of the year. Where do you think Becky Lynch comes into play? Do you think that we see her at the Royal Rumble as a return? No, I, I don't think the Royal Rumble – uh, would it be cool? Yeah, and listen, anything's possible. But uh, I don't think the Rumble, but I do think she'll be back at some point in 2021. You know, she was th- she would be the first woman superstar ever to have bir- to give birth to come back and wrestle within like the first yeah week or two. You know, the only one be- I could think of is like Trish Stratus, but she took off like a decade to have kids, right, right, so right. It's it's unprecedented for for the women's division to have a child right and come back six months, not even six months to a year later after yeah. getting here. Yeah, so she'd be the first one to do it. It'd be it'd be insane if she did. Yeah, man, and you know she to 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 be fair though, she's obviously in a much different position than Trish was when she left. When not that Lita has children, but when Lita left, and you know some of these other. Uh, female superstars left back in the day. I mean, Becky was at the peak of her career, right? She's yeah. she stone cold of the women's division. So, you know, if there's anyone that was going to leave to have kids and to come back, it, it, she's going to be the first one to do so, in my opinion. So, Yeah, I was the timing of it. I mean, I was surprised that she chose now to have a kid where she, but it could, you know, I don't know their personal life, her age, because she's not young. Right in her mid thirties. So, I mean, you know, you're starting to get to that point now so that, you know, that could have been a huge factor. And, you know, she thought, well, if I don't do it now, it's only going to get harder, you know? So, you know, it was her personal choice, but yeah, career wise, the timing of it surprised me, you know? Right. But, yeah. So we'll see. I, I definitely think she'll be back. I do think she'll be back in 2021 at some point. Could it be the Rumble? It could be. I mean, it'd be awesome. I'm not going to lie. I just think it's a little soon. We just had the baby, like, in the beginning of December, end of November. I think it was the very beginning of December. Yeah. Seth's been gone since Survivor Series. So, um, so only, like, a little over a month, two months by the time the Rumble gets here post-birth. Uh, it's a little soon, but who knows? Never say never. Never say never. So, our final category is the male superstar of the year. 
Uh, this probably won't come at any surprise, but go ahead and give us your pick. It's got to be the big dog. Yeah. Roman Reigns. I, I would have put Drew McIntyre in that category, and they were, they were my two final. But because I gave Drew the breakout star um, for you know his breakout year, I mean, it has to be Roman Reigns. I mean, he's just – even though he's really only been back since August, which is, half, you know, like a little less than half the year, I mean, what he's done in these months, he's reinvented his entire career. I, I agree with you, and he's my pick as well too. But, dude, I just thought about it, and I know we talked about this kind of before, but isn't it crazy that January to July – you, we, if this show took place August 1st, we would have said Randy Orton or Drew McIntyre. Yeah. Oh, right. I mean, Randy Orton, yeah, for sure. Randy Orton was the hottest thing. Go- yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, he still is a big deal. He just said Bray Wyatt on fire in the main event of the pay-per-view. But, yeah, he had, like, a lot of momentum going on earlier in the year. Yeah, I mean, the wrestling year, it's like dog years, you know? I mean, it's so some, – so much happens in the span of a year. It feels like – much longer, you know? And, and that just goes to show you, right, with what good creative can do because Roman's only been back since end of August, right? So mm-hmm. we're talking what? September, October, November, four months, right? Yeah, yeah four, just four months. Four months to be recognized as the superstar, the men's superstar of the year because what yeah. he's been able to do in those four months have, has packed such a punch. You would have thought that he's been, the, been this new bloodline, head of the table gimmick, for a year and a half at this point now, right? right? It's been going strong. I mean, it's not stale at all. The guy comes out week after week on SmackDown, and I genuinely look forward to his segments to see what he's going to do. I mean, he's completely reinvented himself. Completely. Uh, I pray to God creative does not mess this up, which I don't think they will, because I think Paul Heyman, like I said earlier, has his no, all over it. There's so few people involved. Right. And I think Roman's at the point of his career – I think Roman's at the point of his career now where he knows what's good and what's not good. And I'd like to think that, not that we know him, but I'd like to think that he'd speak up if they gave him something that he thought was kind of dog shit, right? And say, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not doing that at this point, right? Like like a CM I, Punk. <laughs> I think he's, he's at that Cena level now where like he doesn't have creative control because so, nobody does, maybe Undertaker, you know, and that's it, like to a point. But yeah, he'll they'll work something different. You know, they will all work together. Right. Right. You know, yeah. Um, things that he doesn't think should happen. Won't happen. Yeah. I'm excited to see where he goes in 2021. Right. I know we've talked a lot about our predictions for um, where we want to head. Right. You know, I, mm-hmm. I still want the rock and him to fight at WrestleMania, yeah. uh, especially if there's a crowd, but I'm curious to see if Roman can hold on to the stamina, right? Whether he's the champion or not, but can he hold on to this character for years to come, right? Because if, if they keep going at this speed and they keep doing it right, I, I feel like it's never going to get stale. I mean, unless he starts to do the exact same thing week after week, which knock on wood, he hasn't done yet. No, right? no. But can well, they sustain this is my question. What's going to happen, ironically, is that you're going to turn him to a huge baby face. Right. Which is what they wanted five years ago. But And that's what you'll get that. You may even get it by sometime in 2021. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm curious. He's going to turn him into a huge baby face. It's just inevitable. And, and that's what I'm really most curious about, right, is when the first live full capacity or semi-full capacity crowd comes back, will they cheer him or will they go along with him? Boom. And if they plan on cheering him, you have to think that data be brass know that's going to happen. Right. So what can they do? Can they do something so despicable? Can Roman's character do something so despicable that he gets that crowd to start chanting negative things towards him, start booing him, start calling him an asshole. I mean, like he would have to do something pretty damn tough for that crowd to turn on. Him, Cause I feel like that first crowd is going to cheer the hell out of him when he comes out. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. That's going to be hard to do. Ironically. Right. Yeah, trying to, how to get him to get booed. I mean, th- what a crazy world we live in. But, <laughs> you know, they spent five years trying to figure out how to not get him booed. Now you're going to have to try and figure out how to get him booed. Right. Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, I don't see, you know, you could, and I love cheap heat, but 
I love trashing the local crowd. I don't care how cliche and how old it is. It, it to me, it's always great, but I don't think it's right for him. He won't do that. Not the guy to come out here and say, "Oh boy, being back in Des Moines, Iowa, what a shithole." That's you know, he's beyond that. Yeah, you know what I mean, he you know, so you, to be honest, if he keeps doing what he does, he's been a dastardly heel. He's done terrible things. He's gotten personal. Maybe that's enough to get the people to boo him. Maybe not initially, but eventually. Yep, I agree. I agree. But hands down, best superstar of 2020, right? Oh, right. yeah. I mean, Drew's had a hell of a year. Again, yep. the not, not having a crowd, you know, didn't make his moment what it could have been. Again, no fault of his own. I think he's done a great job holding – that belt with the exception of that month, he didn't have it. I think he's done a great job holding the four down as champion during such crazy times. Um, you know, it's just, you know, it's hard to navigate those waters with, with no crowd. I mean, yeah. you know, you're trying to build a top baby face with no fans. Yeah. It's, it's, that's, it's, I mean, that's, you know, that defies logic. Right. But, um, I think he's done a good job with what he's been given. And yeah, but I mean, Roman just, he's changed the whole landscape. You know, he's changed his career. I mean, I, I was worried that it got to a point where like, if they turned him heel, it's like too late. We don't care anymore. We wanted it a few years ago. It's over. Yeah. We're going to just boo him. Yeah. But no people universally are into Roman Reigns right now. Yeah. Which is shocking because I felt like wrestling fans would still shit on it, even though it's what they've clamored for because A, they felt it was too late, and B, because now they did it, now it's not cool anymore because they actually did it. You know what I mean? Like, like fans wanted them to do it, and they wouldn't. That's why they wanted it. Now they got it. Now they don't want it anymore. But no, they, fans are loving the heel, the heel run. So I'm glad to see that it's gotten over the way it has. Um, I'm definitely curious. I'm I'm curious. I'm curious to see uh, how big of a year Roman will have in 2021. So yeah, more to no, me to too. That, more to come on that. But yeah, before we go, we want to touch on two other quick topics, uh, mm -hmm. and and one of them being just kind of a quick recap, Brett of TLC. We're not going to go through match by match, but just give us your overall thoughts. What did you think of the pay per view this past Sunday? Yeah, no, I thought they put on a really good show. I know uh, that there maybe wasn't a ton of momentum going into it, as there usually isn't with a December pay-per-view. Um, sometimes a December pay-per-view could be a throwaway because it's, you know, getting everybody getting ready for the Rumble. You got the holidays. Obviously, people are busy. Things are, you know, crazy. But um, sometimes those breed the best shows when there's not so much hype and anticipation to it. And I think that was the case on Sunday. I thought, I mean, I was looking forward to the matches. I really was. But I'm a Mark, right, as we are, hence Mark's side of the ring. But uh, I really thought the two TLC matches were fantastic, Drew and, and uh, uh, AJ, and then Miz becoming part of it. I thought that was a great story. Um, and then Kevin Owens and Roman, Jesus. Man. Going into that, I thought, okay, it's going to be a great match. We know Roman's winning, you know, but cool. I'm glad for Kevin to get the spot again. But there were parts in that match where I legit thought, oh, holy shit. They, well, maybe I'm trying to think, well, maybe they'll give it to Kevin for a month. He'll lose it at the, at the Rumble. Like, I'm thinking, like, okay, how can this may actually happen? How would this work? Like, I really thought for a couple of times, my God, Kevin's going to win this. Right. You know, I, I was laying in my chair, like, back. I was I was up like this then during the match. I mean, I was gotten, you know, yeah. really, I thought they – they put on a helmet. I, I think uh, Drew and AJ was great, but I'm going to give match of the night to Roman. And and, and, and and that just goes to show you that predictability isn't a bad thing, right? Because no, well, you go into the pay-per-view, right? And you say before the show starts, okay, here's who's going to win every match, mm -hmm. right? We know Roman's going to retain. We know that uh, McIntyre is probably going to retain. Right. But at the end of the day, these two TLC matches delivered hard, right? They were two yeah. tremendous TLC matches. Right. We knew right. Sasha was going to retain against Carmella, but I'll be damned. Like I said, a couple months ago, that was Carmella's best match of her career. Right. Yeah. They had a tremendous match. Those three 
traditional matches, and, and we're going to save the Inferno match for our, our, our last segment here, but those three matches were like, wow. Even though we yeah. knew he was going to win all of them, all three of them delivered hard. So it just goes to show you that predictability isn't a bad thing as long as the creative behind it is the right choice, right? And right. It was the right, right. So, yeah, I agree with you. I thought TLC overall was really good as well, too. Um, I thought it was better than most years. I think, like you said, December is usually a throwaway pay-per-view, and it's always TLC. Uh, mm-hmm. But this was one of the more enjoyable TLCs uh, to date. And the reason big reason why it was so memorable and this is what we're going to end on here for today fred is the firefly funhouse inferno match between randy orton and uh the fiend bray wyatt so wow um what were your immediate thoughts when you saw what happened i i at first i'm like well there's no way they're going to actually do this. I mean, he, the lights will go out. He's going to get up. Something's going to happen. I mean, they'll tease it. You know, they, they'll, you know, even when he, even when he poured the gasoline on him or lighter fluid, probably whatever. But I was like, okay, well he poured it on, but he's not going to, it's not going to actually. And then when that, that shit lit, I was like, yeah, I mean, again, we know the score. We know it wasn't really Bray Wyatt. Obviously, they're not going to set an actual man on fire on live pay per view. Okay. Or commit murder. <laughs> or, or commit murder. Yeah. Right. But it was still such a cool visual. I mean, regardless of knowing what it was, I mean, you know, I I thought it was it was great. I loved it. What What do you think of? Um, and I read a lot of different people's opinions. Uh, I read uh, Jason Powell. I read, um, what's his name on PW Torch? Um, a guy, I can't remember his name now. It's escaping. I'm trying to think. Uh, he's he's given reviews for quite some time now. On yeah. The- It'll come oh. to me in a second. But uh, uh, the two of them I read religiously. I read every Raw review, every SmackDown review, and every pay-per-view review. And they both shit on it. They both said the pay-per-view was phenomenal until that match and not the match itself until that ending they both said this hocus pocus isn't for them well okay you know what and that that's everybody's opinion i think uh, what are people going to talk about what, what on monday what were people most talking about about the tlc pair review oh, that's my opinion too well, i mean what were they what were they most talking about they were talking about the fiend being murdered by getting set on so the- that's your answer right there yeah it's you know, it's not always about the wrist locks. It's yeah. not always about the headlocks and the t- you know takedowns and all that. Some it's the, it's the moments. It's well, yeah. so did you see the raw rating climbed this week over last week? Yeah, pretty significantly. And I I have to think it's because people tuned in thinking, is the fiend going to show up? Well, like, that was the thing I was most excited for about raw was what was going to happen with it. And I I mean we didn't see the fiend, which I'm going to get to that in a second. The, the rumors swirling about that. I thought the segment with Alexa Bliss was phenomenal. Absolutely. You know, and I was, before I get to a point I just want to make about The Fiend, about what I read, but when I was talking earlier about how the shows in the Thunderdome haven't, they can't compare to the live crowd, you know, that's why I chose the Rumble and that's why, you know, things like that. And I, I said, you can't pick a, a show in the Thunderdome as the best show of the year. But but on the other side of that, there, there are things that are beneficial to the Thunderdome Example, doing what they did with Bray Wyatt, um, you know, because they recorded that part earlier in the day. The match was live. The ending was recorded earlier and they were able to, you know, edit that as you know, after that. Same thing a few weeks ago on Raw when the Firefly Funhouse break turned into The Fiend. They, they couldn't have done that as uh, seamlessly in front of a live crowd. You know, they've done the thing where, you know, Bray shows up, Taker would show up, the lights go down. But something like that, you couldn't do under normal circumstances. So we've gotten cool visuals, you know, because of the circumstance. So there are, there, those are some of the benefits. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I thought, it, I thought it was really cool. I thought, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's hokey. But that's what pro wrestling is. 
The idea of pro wrestling is crazy. The idea of pro wrestling is hokey. It's grown ass men in tights, fake fighting. Okay. What do you, I mean, like, you know, it, that's right. That's why we love it. Wade Keller is the other person I was thinking. Wade Keller. That's it. And I normally like Wade Keller. And I do too. And he's always listen, fair. He's always fair with WWE, but he, uh, and I won't read what he wrote, but, uh, yeah. cause I have to find it, but he basically, I'll paraphrase just saying this hocus pocus is in for him. So, and I, and listen, I respect that. I get it. There are people that are traditionalists, you know, but that's always what attracted me to wrestling. Me too. Honestly, when I was too. younger. I didn't give a shit about the match. Yeah. I gave a shit. I mean, you be honest, to be honest with you, the era that we grew up in, the matches weren't five star garbage. Matches. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> they were great matches. Like Rock and Austin was a great match, right? Say from WrestleMania 15, 17. Yeah. But they weren't like technical masterpieces. Yeah. They were great matches because of A, the, you know, the level of stars that were in them and just the moments in those matches right. made you get off your feet. You know, I mean, there's a place for everything. There's a place for five star wrestling, and there's a place for crazy moments. Right, and, and we got then, a crazy moment on Sunday. Yeah, and to your point about the attitude there, I mean, how many raws? Now when I go back and I'll randomly surf through a raw from like 1999, 2000. Like, yeah, the big stars obviously made raw, and it was so exciting to see because it was a anything could happen feel. But dude, if you ever watch like <laughs> match some of these matches, they were terrible. They were like two minute matches. They were garbage. I mean, yep. you had guys in there that just couldn't mesh well together, right? Chemistry was off for a lot of these superstars fighting each other. And, you know, at the end of the day, you were there for the moments. You were there for Undertaker pinning Stephanie to his unholy cross and marrying her against her will, right? Okay. You were there for Austin spraying McMahon and Rock with a beer truck, right? You were there for Angle spraying the Alliance with his milk truck. I mean, come on, there has been so many, and then I understand this is different, but there's been so many of those moments, right. Where you're like, this is what wrestling is all about. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, unless you're, you know, seven years old, you know, it's not real. You know, the fiend is alive. I mean, he posted on Twitter that night saying, thank you all. Right. Like, yeah, right, right. I think he was really excited about what went down. And I don't know. I just don't, I just don't understand when people like shit on that type of thing. I think it was well done. Right. I think one of the benefits like you said earlier is with the Thunderdome, you can do some masterful cuts and edits, right. To make it look like, I mean, the fact that they somehow got, a fiend dummy in there to burn alive. I mean, in, within seconds looks so yeah. cool because, you know, y y I can't see the transition at all. Right. If you go back and watch that pay-per-view, it's not like no. it looks like a choppy cut. I mean, it just no. moved right into Bray's back on fire. The next thing you know, his whole body's on the ground and yeah. we're putting the lighter fluid on top of him. So, you know, yeah. I get it. It's not for everyone, but I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool. I thought it was a cool visual. Yeah. I, I thought it was great. You know, the, I loved the, it. My, my biggest concern, and I hope I'm wrong, is I don't want them to rush back to Fiend now because obviously no. it makes no sense, right? So. And that, that was going to be my other point. So, yeah, I mean, I was telling you last night that I hope that they, you know, hold them off for a while. You know, maybe at least – I mean, I know how fast the world of WWE goes, so at least till the Rumble, right? Yeah. But I hear that the reason they did this is they're, he's going to come back with a whole new look, a new mask and everything. That would be cool. Yeah, because Vince really wants – and I'm sure Bray too, you know, because guys that were big, you know, they change their look up, right? And take always known to change his look, you know, guys change their look. So as much as the Fiend's look has become, you know, an intellectual property in its own right, they can evolve it and they want to keep it. They don't want it to get stale. Sure. Um, I think that's cool that they're, they're taking the initiative to jump the gun before it gets to, late so yeah they're good um from what i understand he's going to come back with a new look oh well that'll be exciting to see yeah uh, and and i look forward to that but this was a very fun episode fred i appreciate you jumping on i mean obviously you jump on every week but uh, <laughs> uh we had some good conversations and again we're sorry we couldn't get nick to jump on this week he had a yeah. couple uh, extenuating circumstances that prevent him from being here but uh we're actually going to take next week off for the holidays so we'll be back for you guys the first week in january 
Uh, as always, though, show us the love and support. You can find us on True Exact Radio on all platforms. We have some really exciting stuff coming out in January that we won't uh, can't share with you guys yet, but more to come on that. Uh, True Exact Radio is definitely starting to blow up. And uh, I, Fred, I think I speak for both of us. I'm proud to be a part of this network here, what Scott and his team are looking to do with this company. But uh, check out all of our shows. Yeah, check out all of our shows, of course, on Instagram, True Exact Radio, on the YouTube channel, True Exact Radio. You can also find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, uh, iTunes, and the uh, radio app on iPhone. So we'll be back the first week in January as we gear now towards the Royal Rumble season, best time in wrestling, right, uh, from now to WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. uh, I look forward to talking about current events, what's going to happen that week. And, Fred, again, I appreciate your time today, sir. Thanks for jumping on. Oh, thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And I want to just say, why have a Merry Christmas when you can have a no holds barred Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Merry Christmas. Well, on that note, everyone have a wonderful, safe, healthy holiday season. We'll see you all in 2021. Thank you.